Okay, what I wanted to do with this video is basically try to summarize a lot of what you've been modeling and the concepts that you've been learning in this section about globin structure and function uh, so that we really understand the importance of, of the structure to the function so that in the next section we can kind of back up a little bit and then we're going to start looking at the protein sequence, the amino acid sequence that makes up these proteins and understand how that sequence is important to the structure. Okay, you'll remember from earlier we talked about the heme structure and how you have this porphyrin ring structure with the iron in the middle bound to four nitrogen atoms in this porphyrin ring structure that makes a heme group. Then there are two other coordination positions in that iron atom. One in myoglobin and all globins is bound to a histidine amino acid on one side. And then the other open position, coordination position, can then bind oxygen. So that's the basic structure of heme within a globin molecule. And you can see from our, our myoglobin model that this heme that is very, very um, carbon rich is buried in uh, this protein surrounded by a lot of uh, surrounded by a lot of nonpolar amino acids. So it's, it's just kind of wedged in that crevice. And then it's got some, some oxygen, some carboxylic acid groups on the outside that are in contact with the, the water. And so that's how it stays buried in, in the protein. Okay, so let's start talking about what your activity was, your, your tuber folding activity. You either used the beta globin folding kit if you had it, or hopefully you were able to borrow a tuber from an amino acid starter kit and some histidines and do a globin fold in one of the different, with one of the different kits. So if you use the, the beta globin folding kit, you, yours will be green because it's the green part of that kit, right? And so um, what you will see, you'll have, and I haven't put all the extra side chains on, I've just, you, I'm using this, um, the, the green um, piece of, of the folding kit and the two histidines as well as the heme group. And what, what we want to observe here is that this is the highly conserved part of this, of myoglobin and all globins, right? This is what's called the globin fold. And it consists of, we've got one, one helix that, that we have coming in here, but primarily it's made up of this helix and this helix um, and two histidines. And one histidine um, here is called the proximal histidine. And it's called that because it's the one that's closest to the iron of the heme group. And it binds to that iron. It kind of holds that, that heme in place. This other one is called the distal histidine. And it gets very close to the iron atom, but does not bind to it. And it's got an important um, reason for that that we'll talk about a little bit later. And on the side where the distal histidine comes very close to the iron, that is also the area where the oxygen binds to the iron. Okay, so once you've modeled your, your uh, globin fold, you may wonder, well, if the heme is what binds the oxygen, what's the purpose of the rest of the protein? Why do you need that protein? And if you'll remember, earlier we talked about the fact that, that fun the function of heme groups, you'll find heme groups in a lot of different proteins and other, and other molecules. Um, and the, the, the function of the heme group really has to do um, with the context, the environment around it, the protein that surrounds it. And so we're going to, to explore why this, this globin fold is important in the function of, of globins. Now, when you, when you take, um, when you look at iron atoms, you may remember from chemistry that iron can uh, exist in a couple of different states. It can be um, in a, what they call a two plus, which is like a, is the ferrous state, or a three plus ferric state. So ferrous iron, F2, the F2 plus iron can bind oxygen. 
but if it's allowed to bind oxygen, it can readily oxidize to the ferric or three plus state. So it turns out that, in, that if you put heme groups in solution, they will also oxidize, the, the iron in those heme groups will also oxidize into the ferric state. And it's been shown that it does this by creating what they call a heme sandwich. So the oxygen binds um, the iron of two heme groups and forms this kind of sandwich. And then it becomes, the, it turns the iron into the ferric state. Now in myoglobin, this is prevented because it, the heme is buried in this protein environment. And so it, it and, it also has this other histidine, this distal histidine, that gets in the way. So if a heme group wanted to come in and try to bind and form that sandwich, it is not able to because of the protein around it and because of this amino acid, this histidine that gets in the way. So it maintains the ferrous state of the iron so that oxygen can continue to bind and be released. So I want to finish up by talking a little bit about uh, the structure function relationship of heme and globins when binding oxygen. And now this is a, a concept that we're going to return to later when we talk about hemoglobin. Um, remember that in myoglobin we're just talking about one protein chain, one monomer. And so the, the, the conformational change that we're going to be talking about is not as important in myoglobin, but it'll be easier to understand if we learn it now. And then later on, we will talk about how that is involved in um, changes in hemoglobin that um, are due to the fact that there are four protein chains and four um, so that it's a tetramer. And so I think we'll start with this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll meet it again later. So hopefully you'll understand this. Um, so this is a heme that is not bound to oxygen yet, and this is a heme that is, okay? And so we're going to look at the slight differences in the structure of the conformation of these heme groups when it's bound or not bound to oxygen. Now, you might be able to notice that if we look at the plane of, of heme, remember hemes are pretty flat molecules, and you look at the iron atom, you should be able to see that it is um, a little bit above the plane. So you see more iron at, on, the, on the side that's closer to me than on the other side, okay? So the side where this proximal histidine is bound, the iron is closer to it. And then when the oxygen comes in and binds, it actually pulls that iron into the plane so that it is much more flat, much more, it's, it's slightly more flat. It's, it's not a huge difference, but if you look at them side by side, hopefully you'll be able to see that the iron is more in the plane and more evenly distributed across the plane of the oxygenated versus the deoxygenated on the left. And you can also see, if you look at the carboxylic acid groups, you'll be able to see that they change um, and get a little bit more flattened in the plane when the oxygen binds. Now, this seems very, very subtle. And you would say, well, why should that make a difference in anything? But if you realize, if you remember that the iron is attached to the histidine side chain, and the histidine side chain is attached to the backbone of the protein, which is attached to the entire protein, right? So, so let's look at this. And we can see how on your tuber model, if you have the oxygen binding to the heme, which is attached to this, to this proximal histidine, and if, if we can remember that it's kind of pulling the oxygen down away from this, this proximal histidine side, that is going to pull that slightly, right? That's going to pull this, this helix slightly towards there. It's going to change this, this corner 
in this corner. So this is going to, that change is going to be transduced to the structure of the protein. And that slight change in conformation will, will change the way this globin subunit attaches to the one, to the other three that it's connected to in hemoglobin. And that's going to be really important in understanding how oxygen binds to the four subunits of hemoglobin. So stay tuned in the next unit to understand how, why that is important. All right, so I think that this summary should really help you as you move to the next section because now you have a real good idea, hopefully, of the globin fold, why it's important, why it's so, cons so conserved through evolution. And then you can look now at the sequence and try to make sense of the sequence differences and, and the, the, the amino acids that are very highly conserved and knowing that those amino acids that are highly conserved must be important to the structure function relationship. And then hopefully you can start thinking back to what you've learned here to understand why they might be important. All right, good luck with the next section and we'll check in with you again later. Beautiful.